the use and abuse of the church bells england eighteen forty six by walter blunt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org it has fallen to the writer's lot in the divine dispensation to be entrusted with the care or joint care of very many parishes in various parts of england and he knows not any one external matter common to them all and to the neighbourhood surrounding them which has caused him more pain than the ordinary use and the almost utter neglect for their own proper purposes of the church bells indeed so much is the proper use of these holy instruments of edification for such they really are generally lost sight of that among all the new churches which have been builded during the last few years scarcely any have more than one bell a greater number being considered a vain superfluity a kind of ecclesiastical luxury or by deeper thinkers a link between the church and the world and that often in its fiercest contentions vainest hours and most carnal aspect which we may well be rid of in our older churches the position of the belfry on the floor of the church immediately communicating with the nave generally laid entirely open to it often too having no other entrance and not unfrequently forming the passage between the nave and the chancel is sufficient to point out to every thinking person in the parish the very sacred character which was attached to their bells when they were first hung the holy purposes to which they were dedicated and how solemn a matter how truly a service of almighty god the ringing of them was then esteemed in other churches almost always of a later date we find the original position of the ringers at a higher level upon a floor in the tower but the belfry was still laid open by an arch to the body of the church thus yielding evidence that the ringing of the bells was still esteemed a very sacred thing in many churches of more recent foundation but chiefly in such as have been builded within the last two hundred years we meet with a sad evidence of a decay of this feeling or rather principle in that the belfry is placed high up in the tower and quite shut out from the body of the church until at last it has come to pass and this too is the case in some churches of a hundred and fifty years old that the belfry is most frequently entirely omitted and churches of considerable size and pretensions are erected with only a single call bell but while this result has been coming to pass and it has been not a little hastened by mercenary hearts and sacrilegious hands in the robbery of many of our older churches of their bells another change has gradually been taking place of a still more mischievous character in various records which have come down to us bearing date about the times of the reformation reference is often made to and sufficient evidence is given of the superstitious usage of church bells and there is too room for but little doubt that they as well as the church itself were in those later ages frequently applied to profane purposes again the rules and doggerel verses generally from one to two hundred years old which remain in many of our belfries while they often show that the bells were still used for holy purposes and according to their original design afford alas a melancholy evidence that the ringing of them was no longer esteemed a sacred service toward the latter half of the last century that worst age of the english church the ringing of the church bells became a fashionable amusement among the yeomanry and gentry and was degraded to the level on which the hurdle race and steeplechase now stand and while their sweet voices were seldom heard for any holy purpose they were made continually to wake the echoes of the neighbourhood in no more noble cause for no more sacred object than the battue shooting of the present day 
this amusement however at any rate in most parts of the country has long ago become vulgar and gone out of fashion till at last our belfries though dedicated to god's service are left in a state of filthy dilapidation receptacles for dirt and rubbish of all kinds and very frequently the drinking-place of the most profane and profligate persons in the parish who totally ignorant of the sacred character and heavenly uses of those holy instruments they are desecrating ring the bells for their amusement amid oaths and obscenity and sell their voices for drink money for any worldly purpose who ring the muffled or the merry peal for the rich man's sorrow or rejoicing but never send forth a sound of unbought sympathy with the poor far better would it be than this that our bell should be altogether soundless or that our towers as is generally the case with modern churches should possess but one it is to point out the proper use of the church bells and how very beneficial may be their influence when rightly put forth what powerful coadjutors they may be made to the pastoral office and also to give to his brother clergy the benefit such as it is of his own experience in the management of them that the writer has put together the following brief observations and suggestions but concerning which he would humbly and earnestly express a hope that no one will act upon them until he can himself realize the church's system on which they were grounded it would be far better that one who from whatever cause is not endeavouring to spread practical holiness among his people according to the church's method which such as have tried it and other methods well know to be the only successful one it would be far better that he should be content with silencing the bells altogether or preventing them being rung on improper occasions than that he should introduce a system into his parish which in such a case would be an unreal one and as such would be hurtful instead of beneficial to his flock in the ordinarily received formularies and canons of the english church i mean those which have been put forward subsequent to her reformation there is not much special notice of the church bells to be found at the period of the reformation and for some time after the use seems to have been generally understood and acted upon and thus a law of custom superseded the necessity of any written law little therefore in the way of positive command was enacted except for the abolition of certain evil habits which had grown up these notices however which do occur in the laws of our church during the last two hundred and fifty years are quite sufficient to show that she now recognizes their ancient holy uses and no others preface to the book of common prayer and all priests and deacons are to say daily the morning and evening prayer either privately or openly not being let by sickness or some other urgent cause and the curate that ministereth in every parish church or chapel being at home and not being otherwise reasonably hindered shall say the same in the parish church or chapel where he ministereth and shall cause a bell to be told thereunto a convenient time before he begin that the people may come to hear god's word and to pray with him canon forty seven sixteen o three to four and when any is passing out of this life a bell shall be tolled and the minister shall not then slack to do his last duty and after the party's death if it so fall out there shall be rung no more than one short peal and one other before the burial and one other after the burial canon eighty eight sixteen o three to four the churchwardens or questmen and their assistants shall suffer no plays feasts banquets suppers church ales drinkings temporal courts or leets lay juries musters or any other profane usage 
to be kept in the church chapel or churchyard neither the bells to be rung superstitiously upon holy days or eves abrogated by the book of common prayer nor at any other times without good cause to be allowed by the minister of the place and by themselves the belfry is a part of the church and is as is the rest of the church dedicated to god any profane use of the belfry or any use of it for common worldly purposes any unholy light irreverent conduct there is a direct sin against god a breaking of the third commandment the bells are to the whole parish what a church organ is to an assembled congregation they wake up the heart's affections and lead us in our praises to god but they have a holy use and purpose of still broader character they call us to the church and tell us it is time for public prayer and bid all come who can they warn too those who cannot come that it is prayer time now that they may raise their hearts with us and wish that they were with us and send their desires heavenward and have direct communion with us in our prayers though absent in the body they preach to all continually of death and judgment of heaven and hell and while they invite the willing they warn those who will not come they remind us all amid our busy occupations twice every day that this is not our continuing city that we are but pilgrims and sojourners upon earth and while they warn the slothful christian thus continually to gird up his loins and haste heavenwards they preach to those who never hear another preacher and tell them of a judgment to come again they wake the heart to gladsomeness on all the holy feast days of the church loudly calling upon us to rejoice in the lord and in times of fasting and humiliation eloquent by their silence or by their mournful sounds they call us to penitence and sorrow again if any of our neighbours rich or poor be joined together by holy church in marriage the bells ring out their cheerful peal of joy bidding us all to raise up our hearts in thanksgiving with our brethren whose marriage represents unto us the mystical union which is betwixt christ and his church for that marriage is honourable in all men and if one member be honoured all the members rejoice again when any is passing out of this life the passing bell is tolled acquainting us with that awful circumstance warning us that our own time may even now be at hand and calling upon us to pray for our departing brother that in this his hour of death the good lord may deliver him and not suffer him for any pains of death to fall from god that one and all of us minister and people whether present with our suffering brother or absent from him may put up to god in his and in our own behalf the commendatory prayer for a sick person at the point of departure which is provided for us in our prayer book at the end of the service for the visitation of the sick and when the soul is departed and delivered from this death-bearing body the bells ring out in notes of solemn cheerfulness their peal of chastened joy calling us to thankfulness for our brother's deliverance from trial and difficulty and peril this sinful tempting ever dangerous world and when the body of our brother is being carried to its resting-place to be laid up in safety for the resurrection and after two it is deposited in the tomb the bells ring out again their note of praise bidding us to sorrow not as those that have no hope for that the soul of him which has departed hence in the lord is now in joy and felicity and that this corruptible body shall put on incorruption reminding us that with respect to him we have neither time nor cause for grief that we must one and all of us return each to the diligent performance of the hard-handed duties of his own position and that while we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling with reference to ourselves with reference to him we may go on our way rejoicing 
thus holy are the church bells and thus great is their holy usefulness to us if therefore they are used for any common purposes if upon occasion of mere worldly joy if when the church would call us all to gladness her bells are made to sound the note of sorrow if their sweet voices should be bought and sold loudly proclaiming the rich man's weal or woe and silent or almost silent upon christ's poor then is their usefulness destroyed their holy purpose abolished or reversed and a grievous sin is committed against the church and against god to whom they are dedicated but of the ringers the bells are dumb without them it is they who enable the bells to put forth their solemn sound and tune them to their various purposes how holy therefore is the ringer's office how deeply religious is the service of such men how careful should they be about their manner of ringing how sinful must any carelessness of ringing be how very sinful any levity of behaviour in the performance of their duties and inasmuch as no one can occupy a holy office without incurring a large increased responsibility for the attainment of individual holiness and no one who does not become better by exercising or holding a holy office can fail of becoming worse how very careful should all who are in authority be about the appointment and the conduct of the ringers how very watchful should the ringers be of their own lives and conversation suggestions one that the belfry should be carefully kept as clean and in as good repair both substantial and ornamental as any other part of the church and that it should be decorated with texts of scripture and other appropriate ornaments if possible the belfry should be open to the body of the church or at the most divided from it by a low open screen for any other arrangement will be found very inconvenient for the due performance of the ringer's duty and will add to any difficulty which may exist in realizing the sanctity of the place two that no person except the ringers and other officers of the church be permitted at any time to enter the belfry without the leave of the minister or church wardens three that no person except the ringers be permitted at any time to sound any of the bells without the special permission of the minister four that the ringers be appointed by the minister and church wardens and hold their office during good conduct five that the ringers be regarded as a part of the general choir and be placed in all things on an equality with it six that two companies of ringers be appointed each company being equal in number to the bells the one company being the regular ringers performing and being responsible for all regular duty and enjoying all emoluments the other being a supplemental company out of which any vacancy which may occur in the first company shall be filled up and any member of which may be employed by any member of the first company to supply his place during any necessary absence seven that one member of each company of ringers appointed by the minister and church wardens be held responsible for the conduct of the company in the belfry and report to the minister and church wardens any ill conduct whether in or out of the belfry of any member of his company which may come to his knowledge eight that the use of the bells be confined strictly to ecclesiastical purposes nine that a list or table of the days and times and occasions of ringing signed by the minister and church wardens be suspended in the belfry and in the church porch that a statement that no occasion mentioned therein is to be omitted but upon the direction of the minister and no occasion is to be added thereto but upon the joint direction of the minister and church wardens ten that the ringing table should contain the following rules a that a bell should be tolled for a quarter of an hour before morning and evening prayer according to the direction of the prayer book b that the bells should be chimed for a stated time before the use of the service for the holy communion c that the bell should be rung in peal for a quarter of an hour and no more after every marriage d 
that the great bell should be tolled according to the canon for a quarter of an hour when any is passing out of this life or appears to be dying e that the bell should be rung according to the canon in a steady solemn though cheerful peal for five minutes and no more as soon as may be after the death which particular peal should be kept strictly for this purpose and never applied to any other f that the bells should be rung or chimed according to the canon in a steady grave and solemn though cheerful peal kept strictly for this purpose for ten minutes before every burial g that the bells should be rung according to the canon in a steady solemn though more cheerful peal kept strictly for this purpose for five minutes after every burial h that the bell should be rung in peal at early morning for a quarter of an hour and at other specified times on every lord's day and on every other festival commanded by the church to be kept holy and on the day of the dedication of the parish church i that the bells be not rung in peal except the death and burial peals for any purpose on any friday in the year except it be christmas day nor in the season of lent except upon the lord's day and the feast of the annunciation j that at the opening of christmas day the feast of the circumcision the feast of the epiphany the feast of the purification presentation of christ in the temple the feast of the annunciation incarnation easter day the feast of the ascension and the feast of pentecost the bells should be rung in peal for five minutes at midnight k that on fridays and other fasting days the great and the little bell should be rung together in alternate toll for a quarter of an hour at early morning or at other specified times l that in order that they may have opportunity of practice a special quarter or half hour be appointed on each festival for the second company of ringers to ring in appeal eleven that in order to prevent any mercenary use of the bells or any difference being made between rich and poor with respect to them and in order to secure a fair remuneration to the ringers a regular definite yearly salary should be paid to the first company of ringers and no ringer should be permitted to receive any payment or gratuity for the performance of his duty on any special occasion very beneficial results have been obtained from the following out of this system and it has become evident to those who have tried it that the more perfectly it is carried out so much more than in due proportion are the benefits indeed after the first difficulties are overcome it is much easier to carry out the whole system than a part of it for when in action as a whole it has a completeness and consistency and beauty which approves it to the minds of thinking persons generally of those even who from circumstances are a not well affected to the church perhaps the most difficult part of the system to carry out or rather to begin upon in some places would be the church's rule concerning ringing at a death and before and after a burial and yet in some parts of the midland western and northern counties this rule is and always has been complied with not indeed for all for the poor cannot pay the ringers and the rich consider it vulgar but for yeomen and tradesmen and in other parts of the country e g in cornwall the doggerel verses which are found in the belfries bear witness that the observance of the rule was maintained up to no very distant period however people generally have such heathenish notions concerning death and burial that the great majority of them in almost every parish would require much instruction concerning them according to the tone of our praise-breathing burial service before they could be expected to understand and appreciate the church's rule with respect to her bells on these occasions if however careful explanation were tenderly and lovingly given and the peals for the several occasions properly and judiciously chosen 
and carefully kept for those occasions only so that the trumpet should not at any time give an uncertain sound it would soon be found that the observance of the rule is greatly conducive in spreading and deepening more christian principles and feelings concerning death it is true that occasions might occur and that not unfrequently in many parishes when the sound of thanksgiving for the death of one for whom he could have but little hope would grate harshly upon the clergyman's ear and wake up strange contending feelings in his heart but surely the sound of thanksgiving from the church tower cannot be inappropriate when the words of thanksgiving from the priest's own mouth in the burial service are not so and it would not only be possible but greatly beneficial to the parish both in its immediate effect and as paving the way for a return to a more complete system of christian discipline to silence the bells on particular occasions and forbid the accustomed sound of public thanksgiving on the departure of such as had lived unholy lives another difficulty which will be likely to present itself in many places is the provision of a fixed yearly salary for the ringers but the difficulty however great is as nothing in proportion to the benefits which will accrue and while the accomplishment of the object is worth any effort and almost any sacrifice the difficulty will seldom be found so great as it may at first sight appear in a parish which had six bells where the price of labour was at about the average rate in country towns where the population was between four and five thousand the great majority of which were church people and where there was a double daily service without which i do not suppose that the system would do much if any good the whole annual expense was less than nineteen pounds but it is evident that the expense would be different for different parishes in fact for one fixed element in calculating the expense there are three variable elements the fixed element is the number of ordinary days and holy days in the year the variable elements are one the ordinary price of labor in the parish two the number of bells three the average number of marriages and burials which must of course be dependent upon the number and character of the population in making a calculation of the proper amount of salary the price of labor should for obvious reasons be reckoned higher than that usually paid in the parish and the number of marriages and burials at above the average in cases where all have not been brought to church inasmuch as any such return to consistent holy practice if done in a christian loving manner is sure to win the affections of the people for raising the required amount whatever it may be a well-affected parish would doubtless contribute something from its rates if not all as the law requires it to do there might also be a collection at the offertory once or twice a year for the purpose and there might be a ringer's box placed in the church under the lock and care of the minister and church wardens to receive contributions of the faithful toward defraying the expenses of this part of divine service lastly in parishes which are moderately well endowed the priest may well take it into consideration whether he may not duteously and beneficially devote some small portion at any rate of the income which is entrusted to him for the furtherance of the spiritual well-being of his flock to the honour of god and the welfare of his people in this so very important branch of his service End of The Use and Abuse of the Church Bells, England, 1846, by Walter Blunt. Weather Prophets in Furs and Feathers by Nat Wetzel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org weather prophets in furs and feathers by nat wetzel saturday evening post february seventeenth nineteen o six
we are told by the scientist of the united states weather bureau that forecasting the state of the weather for more than a few days ahead is still mere guesswork and no doubt this is correct so far as man's prophetic labors are concerned however the little weather observers in furs and feathers have strange gifts of prophecy which enable them to make long-distance forecast with an accuracy decidedly baffling to the human scientist from earliest boyhood i have been almost constantly associated with hunting people so much so that a waggish old man in my native place declared that i was born with a gun in my hand now people who hunt are compelled at once to be keen observers of the weather for the shifting vane on the church spire does not show the change of the wind more nimbly than the creatures of the woods and fields reflect the changes in atmospheric conditions only a few weeks ago i revisited my boyhood home in the mountains of pennsylvania and had my first lesson on the powers of animals as weather prophets recalled to me in a most vivid and convincing way one of the first memories that came to me as i set foot on the old home place was that of my nut tree as i called it taking my daughters with me i said to them now i'm going to show you how i used to get my winter nuts and get them all cracked and shucked too we tramped through the woods until i reached the familiar spot and exclaimed there tis girls just as it used to be see the hole up there that is right at the outlet of a red squirrel's nest grandfather helped me tap it the day we located it and as we took out several quarts of nuts he exclaimed that we were going to have a severe winter of course i asked him to explain why and he told me that in some way the red squirrels knew when a cold winter was coming and that the store of nuts laid up for a severe season was invariably larger than when a mild winter was at hand in which they would be able to supplement their stores with forage from day to day the hole was carefully stopped up again and the squirrels continued to use the nest year after year and as the nutting season drew toward a close each autumn i would remove the packing and let the nut meats fall out into the little sack tied below the hole the quantity of my spoils varied from year to year and grandfather's remark made me take special note of the character of the winter there was no escaping the fact that the heavy harvest of nuts from the larder of the squirrels always indicated a hard winter whereas a light open winter followed a scant supply of nuts from the hole in the old tree of course i felt obliged to confess that sacking the stores which the thrifty little reds had put by was a piece of cruelty excusable only on the ground that i was a boy with all a boy's barbaric cruelty under the title of weather folklore the department of agriculture has collected a mass of old weather sayings and i have found particular delight in going over those relating to birds and animals as there is not a more interesting way of getting at the weather instinct of the furred and feathered creatures than by a survey of these odd old saws and maxims let us take a quick and passing glance at some of them as they are presented in this official bulletin when birds of long flight hang about home expect a storm all my experience goes to show that the reverse of this statement is true depend upon it when ducks feed early and begin to fly about in a nervous and restless fashion a storm is on its way i have observed the truth of this literally hundreds of times until it has come to seem strange to me that so patent a phenomenon should have escaped the attention of any man who shoots ducks or who lives in a country frequented by them not very long since i was out with a party of hunters in the neighborhood of corpus christi the greatest duck country on the gulf coast where millions of teal mallards and other varieties spend the winter the day was mild and clear and every prospect was of peace and pleasantness to any person not familiar with bird signs there was everything to indicate a continuance of the delightful weather of the moment and nothing whatever to suggest approaching inclemency let alone a storm but i saw wedges of ducks darting and circling about in the upper air alighting for a moment perhaps and then taking to wing again gentlemen i remarked to my companions we're going to have a hard storm in the course of a few hours 
this suggestion was received with shouts of laughter and i was at once offered very substantial wagers as a proof of the derision in which they held my powers as a weather prophet finally one of them paused to inquire upon what i based my absurd forecast we had been in camp and out of reach of weather bulletins or signals for several days and i said wait for two days and then i'll tell you the very next day we caught a regular norther that made us curl up and hug the campfire when the storm was fiercest i took occasion to remind them of how the ducks had been flying the day before and to explain my theories regarding birds, animals, and weather. Geese have the same general habits as ducks, and are just as sensitive weather barometers as their smaller cousins. Another old saying has it that when a severe cyclone is near, birds become puzzled, fly in circles, dart about impetuously, and are easily entrapped. This is no doubt well founded. It corresponds with my own observations, and, I believe, with those of lighthouse keepers who are in favorable position for observation. So many birds dash themselves against the windows of lights that the glass has to be carefully protected by strong screens. Of course, birds driven in the teeth of a storm go against the lights, but so do many before they are actually caught by the storm. When birds cease to sing, rain and thunder will probably occur. That may be, and doubtless is, all right, as applied to certain kinds of birds, but its application is by no means general. Take the robin, for instance. Who that lives in the country has not repeatedly heard a score of times the cheerful song of a robin when a warm rain was drenching the thirsty ground? Too much importance is also attached, it seems to me, to the saying, Birds and fowls, oiling feathers, indicate rain. At first I accepted this theory, but more careful observation brought me to the conclusion that, though they almost invariably oil up before a storm, they do not neglect this part of their toilet in dry weather, and consequently it loses its significance as a weather sign. In the same category I placed the tradition that when fowls roll in the dust, rain is at hand. In any event, the domestic fowl is an unreliable weather indicator. Natives of the arid district of western Texas, where the famous bat caves are located, will tell you that you need have no better storm indicators than those curious creatures. If they are out in force and making the night hideous with their uncanny squeaks, then you may look out for a storm. The raccoon is a clever little forecaster, so far as the coming of soft weather is concerned. Time and time again, when there was so tight a freeze that the smaller animals would leave no tracks on the crust, I have heard the holler of a coon and remarked, Things are going to warm up tomorrow, and we'll be able to track coons in the snow. I do not recall a single instance in which that prophecy failed to come true. If the weather is going to keep tight and cold, Mr. Coon will lie quiet and snug in his home in a tree. But if there's a break-up coming, he is about the first to feel it in his bones, and he just does a little hollering to tell the wise ones about it. When chimney swallows circle and call, they speak of rain, is a saying accredited to the Zunai Indians. At any rate, it is a shrewd observation, and one which a little close observation of these interesting birds will confirm. The crane is a bird which figures prominently in weather folklore. One expression has it that, when cranes make a great noise or scream, expect rain. It is not my observation that the approach of rain stirs up the cranes so much as the coming of cold and sleet. These birds hate the cold and set up a regular powwow when they feel its approach. Another bird which holds the center of the stage when it comes to folklore is the crow. But he is such a shrewd, sophisticated, and half-human scoundrel that I do not have any confidence in him as a weather prophet, or in any other capacity outside of matching his wits against man's wits. One crow flying alone is a sign of foul weather, but if crows fly in pairs, expect fair weather. May sound very wise, but for the general reason which I have stated, 
I attach no weight to it. There is only one movement of the crow which, in my experience, has any weather significance. Immediately before a cold storm, the crows will assemble in a thick grove on the sheltered side of a hill. They are partial to a pine grove on the south side of a hill, when this does not expose them to the prevailing winds. When the peacock loudly bawls, soon we'll have both rain and squalls. Here is a saying that will be verified by the experience of thousands of men who have had the advantage of a boyhood spent in the country. I remember that our haying operations, when I was a farm boy, were governed by the behavior of our neighbors' peafowls. If they set up a hollering when we had hay down, there was a hustling to get it in, and no chances were taken in leaving it out overnight. The weather generally verified the adage I have quoted. It is not too much to call the peacock the first weather bureau. He issued his bulletins to the ancient kings when this country had not known the face of a white man. Blackbirds are fairly good forecasters at short range. If they hold a regular camp meeting in the brushes or cane breaks when they roost, you may look out for a storm next day, particularly if they retire early to their night lodgings. If sea fowls retire to the shores or marshes, a storm is approaching. This is probably true, although I have had small opportunity to watch gulls, petrels, and birds of that character. What I do know is that ducks and geese will not strike out into deep water when there is a storm on the immediate program. Rather, they will beat back inland, if possible. Speaking broadly, an imminent change in the weather is sensed by the birds, and if the change is to a cold storm, then the birds become excited and show it by characteristic cries and by a general restlessness. Some sense the characteristics of uncommon weather much farther in advance than do others. I have already spoken of the red squirrel as a good long-distance forecaster. Prairie chickens and quail are not far behind him in the display of this remarkable faculty. If I lived in a locality where these birds nest, and if I followed a business in which a knowledge of whether the summer would be wet or dry would be of material advantage to me, I go out and make a study of the nest on the prairies. If they were in low places and in the little hollows, then I'd conclude that a fairly dry season was in store. But if the nest were set upon little bumps and hillocks, I'd know for a practical certainty that the summer would bring an abundant rainfall. Very likely the scientific weather observer, who knows all about meteorology and nothing about birds, will laugh at this statement. But if he had watched the nesting habits of these birds year after year, and in reference to the amount of rainfall in the weeks and months immediately succeeding the building of the nest, he would know that the instinct of the bird gets a line on the weather in a way that is wonderful. In my school days, a favorite pastime of the boys was hunting screech owls, cutting them out of their holes in trees and shrubs. We went forth armed with axes and scouring the slashings. We hadn't been at this very long when I observed that we never found a screecher in a hole on the north side of a tree or stub, and that we seldom chopped into one having a south exposure that did not contain an owl. For a time I kept this interesting observation to myself, and I would never choose as mine any nest not opening to the south. Day after day the boys would ask, How is it that you always pick the holes with birds in them and leave the empty ones to us? Finally I told them, Because an owl has too much sense to put up with a house that has its front door open to the north wind. A hunter who has even a little practical knowledge of the weather habits of animals can bring home game where another would fail utterly. A fox, for example, will shift with the sun. In winter let the sun come out warm of a sudden, and you will look in vain for foxes on the north side of a ridge or mountain. They will be on the south side where the sun strikes warmest. Why? Probably because they enjoy the warmth, but also, no doubt, because they can dodge dogs and throw them off the scent more easily where the tops of stumps, logs, and fences are bare the snow having been thawed from them. Let dogs start out after a fox where the trail is well defined in the snow, 
and they'll run by sight instead of by scent. If the foxes where the sun has melted and snow from the tops of logs and stumps, he can make a few high jumps and throw the dogs into confusion, for they do not change their tactics from sight to scent in a second. This clever trick gives the fox more time in which to get away. Rabbits hate a cold north wind, and the moment one comes up, it's no use to look for a cottontail on the north side of a hill. Go to the south side, and you'll find him waiting for you, with his head toward the hole of his retreat. As a boy, I always went after mink, muskrat, and skunk, whenever a long cold spell was succeeded by a thaw, and generally I was able to get what I went after under those conditions. Invariably so, when the thaw eventually proved to be the occasion of a spring freshet. These animals will not travel in the daytime unless they feel that their houses are threatened by a flood. Then they will go outside and watch for the waters to rise. I have seen mink doing sentinel duty outside their holes when the water was not within three feet of the front doors to their houses, and they seldom get alarmed when there is no real occasion for it. Deer are also keen to understand the coming of a flood or even of a wet storm. It is idle to look for them in hollows when a spell of wet weather has started in. They will have reached the ridges and the high spots before the rain. Be sure of that. After a good keen frost has come, the hunter should not expect to find prairie chickens in little groups as in the earlier part of the season. Instead, they will, where they are comparatively plentiful, be banded in flocks of fifty to a hundred, and will be twice as wild as before, flying high and fast. The gun that gets them then must be far-reaching and accurate, and handled by a sure and ready marksman. The frost seems to put wisdom into the heads of these birds, and spread into their wings. End of Weather Prophets in Furs and Feathers by Nat Wetzel Read by Mary in Arkansas